our objectives are to define line as it applies to 2D design, to understand the categories and different functions of line, to learn about the physical characteristics and spatial dynamics of line, become sensitive to line color, texture, movement, direction, and relationship to format, and also to appreciate line as a graphic organizer of information. But let's never forget that we can have a lot of fun with it, too. Mark making, one of the very, very first steps that most folks take as they begin to create visual design is to make a mark with a brush or a pen or a crayon, usually at a very young age. And uh, I would really like to be inspired by this photograph to think that we're um, going to mark freely, we're going to mark right from our hearts, we're going to make marks that are exploratory, that are unpredictable, uh, marks that we don't know exactly what will come of them, but we can make them with a lot of joy. That's a different approach to mark making than we started off with in Illustrator, making those boxes of exactly the same size in exactly the right place. There's room for both in our work. We're going to start off by looking at the physical characteristics of line. Variety and contrast in mark making, quality and line weight, are often what make a work of art unique. This is a drawing on fabric by a favorite artist of mine, Paul Clay, who famously said, drawing is taking a line for a walk. We'll be taking lots of lines for a walk in this assignment, and we'll be giving them lots of different qualities as we strut them around. In math, of course, a point or, uh, has no dimension. It's just a location, a position in space. Even a line in Euclidean geometry, although it has dimension, it has distance, it doesn't have physicality. It's simply a distance. But in art, a dot, a dab, a blob, any kind of a mark has mass as well as position. And in Illustrator, we have freedom to assign all sorts of different um, textures, weights, values to any line that we make. Let's look at line weight, first of all. Thick lines create the illusion that they come forward in space, and thin lines create the illusion that they push back into space. Now I've written that as if it were true for everyone. Some folks looking at this picture may find that the thick lines don't particularly come forward for them, but most people do. These generalizations about what makes things look three-dimensional to us are subjective, and they are more powerful for some people than for others. So if you don't absolutely agree with me that the thick lines come forward, don't worry about it. This illusion can be powerful or weaker depending on a lot of other factors too, besides your subjectivity. Let's look at some examples. So in this example, I think most people would agree that the box that's made of thicker lines seems to come forward a bit. But when we reverse the picture and put the box that's made of thicker lines up on top and the thinner box down below, the illusion isn't quite so strong for many people. And that's probably because when we look at objects below eye level, we're used to seeing things that are farther away appearing a little bit higher. If you take a photograph of two chairs, for example, one that's right near you and one that's a little further away on your dining room floor, you'll see in the photograph that the farther chair is higher. So in other words, there are two things operating here. The thicker lines make the box want to push forward, but the height on the page makes it want to recede. And so we're getting mixed signals. Now here, when we put the thicker lines closer to the bottom of the format, and we also make the thicker box bigger, it's pretty hard to resist the illusion that that thicker box is a little bit closer to us because we know that things look smaller when they're farther away. They look smaller if they're below eye level. They tend to look higher. 
And so now we have two things reinforcing the fact that the thicker line box is a little closer. One of the most powerful things we can do to create a feeling of three dimensions is also the simplest, and that is to overlap. When you combine all these things, the thicker lines, the height on the page, the change in size, and the overlapping, it's very, very difficult for most people to resist the illusion that that box made of thicker lines is actually in front. That's what we call illusionistic space. Pretty easy to do, right? Let's look at that in a much more beautiful example here. This painting by Tahaku was uh, Cryptomeria trees, part of a much larger screen, very beautiful um, ink painting, um, painted before linear perspective had arrived in Japan, and yet has a very, very strong feeling of illusionistic space, I think. Um, there's a lot of overlapping, quite a strong range of value. In other words, the um, lines on the trees that seem to be a little closer to the front here are quite a bit darker. There's obviously a little bit more sharp detail in these trees that are in the front, especially in this one. And as the trees go back behind each other, and I'm saying they're behind each other because of the illusion, we see this branch overlapping this tree. We see the height on the page of, of uh, these trees going up as they seem to go back in space. We see the value of the trees getting lighter and lighter. We see the detail getting less and less. Very strong illusion of space on this flat piece of paper with this um, beautifully but very simply painted um, painting. So overlapping of shapes and lines and varying line quality and weight can all work together to create a sense of depth. And here again is a beautiful example in a drawing by Edgar Degas of two ballerinas, very rapidly drawn, possibly while they were sitting there stretching right in front of him. And you see the um, areas that are created with darker value not only catch our eye and lead us through the drawing, but they um, seem to indicate areas that are closer to us or that pop up a little bit from the rest of the drawing so that we see that the torso and the head are above the skirt here. We see that this head is above the elbow because of the slight overlapping there. Here's an example of a very different way of using line weight almost to create a visual puzzle. This uh, very beautiful photo uh, silkscreen makes it almost hard for a moment to see what's going on and your eyes have to untangle the shapes that are created by these lines. Interestingly, the lines don't outline the shapes. Instead, these lines imply the shapes by ending at a certain place so that we can tell that there is an edge here even though the edge is not outlined. And that happens over and over again in this piece. We see edges implied by the uh, way lines change direction or the way that they their uh, pattern changes from thin to thick rather than by the outlining of shapes. This part of the a photograph here uses cross contours to help us see the volume of the arm and the hand inside the glove and you can see that done in a simpler way here in this logo where the contours surround the volume rather than outlining it as we normally think of lines being drawn to show shapes. This is a very powerful way of showing space. These uh, tubes here, or whatever they are, cylinders that are entwined in this logo seem to be wearing a striped glove or a stocking, very much like the model in the photograph. Cross contours. Lines can have lots of other qualities as well. These lines, for example, are anything but clean. They are vigorous, they are scabby, they are rough, they are broken, they're uh, three-dimensional, they're complex. Um, these lines would be very, very hard for you to copy 
you'd almost have to draw them carefully in order to copy them because they are so chaotic and organic. Those qualities are a little bit more difficult to get in Illustrator than the real crisp, clean lines of our boxes in Assignment 1. Easy and fun to get in paint, though. These are uh, pictures of Jackson Pollock, a famous action painter of the 1950s. He created his art um, by very, very vigorously and physically pouring, splashing, brushing, throwing paint onto very, very large canvases, often on the floor, as you see him working here. The uh, canvases become a record of the physicality of his paint process. People who have never seen these in real life tend to have very strong reactions. My four-year-old could have painted that, that sort of thing. Um, but I would suggest that you hold off judging Jackson Pollock until you see one of his paintings in the flesh. These really cannot be appreciated at a small size. When you stand in front of one of these, I get a feeling almost of his physical presence because the, um, the way the paint um, has been applied to the canvas is so bound up in the actions of his body. Let's look at how line can be used to describe shape and contour. There are three basic ways that I'd like to look at. The first one is the way that probably all of you have used before. So in creating a shape, line can serve as a continuous edge of a figure, an object, or a mass. Another way that line can show shape, though, is to imply it. Line can imply a shape without outlining its contours. For example, a pattern of linear stripes can show us where the edges of a shape are without outlines just as we saw in that photograph of the model with the striped clothing, or the logo with the cross contours. And finally, lines can be implied by repeated shapes. The repetition moves our eyes from one shape to the next, creating a line of movement where no actual line is drawn. In assignment two, you are challenged to work with line alone and to try not to work with shape. If you do work with shape, I'd like you to use this technique here, implying shape without outlining it, or repeating shapes to create lines so that line is emphasized. What I'd like you to avoid is this first example, the most common way line is used to serve as a continuous edge of a figure. Let's see what that would mean. Using line to define a shape. This is what we call a contour line. Lines define the boundary between shapes, like, for example, the boundary between the figure and what we call the negative shape that surrounds the figure. Clean, smooth contour can be a very, very graceful expression, and uh, nothing could illustrate that better than this beautiful Henri Matisse silkscreen. This is a very, very good way to use line. You've done it before, I'm sure, and I've done it a thousand times, but not on assignment two. <laughs> We're going on assignment two to use line for itself alone and not to outline shape. So let's go and look at some of the ways we will use line in assignment two. We can use line to imply shapes for this assignment. This striped tea towel is full of implied shapes even though no shapes are outlined with contour lines. The only lines that you'll see in here are these diagonal blue and white lines. And yet we do see by the place where they, where they bend, where they change direction, where they uh, alternate color, we see edges implied which build up and create shapes, little squares, little L shapes, little bizarre shapes. So although this is full of shapes that have rectilinear edges, only diagonal lines are used to imply them. This would be a great way to work with shape for assignment two. Another great way to work with shape for assignment two is to use repeated shapes to imply a line, as in this bench here. You see these little skinny rectangles are repeated over and over and over and gently curved 
to make these very, very long linear shapes. That's a great way to use shape in assignment too. Line and value. Contrast in lightness and darkness that a line exhibits against its background is called its value or value contrast. Usually every line needs a value different from its surroundings in order to be visible. There's another way line can be used relative to value. It can be used for shading, to add value to a shape, or to give a feeling of volume to a three-dimensional form. Let's look at that. Cross-hatching is something that if you've ever done much drawing, you've probably been exposed to. So cross-hatching simply means to uh, create, usually with a pencil or a pen, often very rapidly, a, a series of parallel lines often going in different directions to increase the darkness of the uh, tone that's achieved and give a sense of shadow or value. Cross-hatching can also be combined with the idea of the cross-contour so that if in the, the parallel lines are curved so that they seem to follow a form and to um, create the topography of this uh, 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 form that's underneath them, this volume, they can really, really then give us a strong feeling of three dimensions, especially in the hands of a master like Goltius. This is a detail from his Massacre of the Innocents, and it's very masterful handling of the cross-contour, cross-hatching. And finally, movement. That's going to be an important part of, an, of assignment too. Line can be used to imply the feeling of physical movement in a work of art or design, and it can also be used to express a pathway or a journey that a person or a person's eyes really can take through a piece of art. Line or implied line can draw our attention to the things the artist wants us to pay attention to. And this will be very important in assignment too because we are going to be taking a master artwork from the list that's provided in the assignment and finding the path that our eyes follow through that artwork as the basis or springboard to start off assignment two. So let's look at how artists use line to imply movement. How do your eyes move through this piece? I can't answer that, of course. I've found that many of my students move their eyes through the piece this way, starting at the top and then coming down to this slightly more complex area at the bottom. Some of my students tell me that their eyes move through the piece this way, from side to side. Some people say that their eyes move through the piece kind of up and down like this, following these um, very, very three-dimensional looking um, grooves or ridges in the piece. Bridget Riley is a member of the um, school of painting called Op Art from the 60s, and uh, I'll be showing you more of her work. She uh, is a, a favorite of mine. Here's a great piece. She's called this piece Descending, and so obviously she seems to intend that our eyes will start at the top and move towards the bottom, although I find that my eyes move up and down this piece. One thing that I really love about this piece is the implied curves in it. This painting is created entirely from straight lines. Very, very hard to believe when you first look at it, but the places where the lines bend create these strong, strong feelings of um, implied curves, even though none of the lines are actually curved. Another very, very common uh, way to use line to show movement is to repeat a uh, linear figure like this so that it looks almost as if the thing is animated, as if the thing is being shown in several different positions, jumping around a little bit, and actually um, depicting motion. You've seen this in cartoons a lot, where you'll see a dog's tail wagging and little wag lines on either side of it. That's exactly the same thing that this artist is doing with the fiddle bows here. Um, very, very uh, beautiful feeling of a music with a jumpy tempo and uh, musicians who are moving their bodies as they express uh, the music through their playing. 
Let's look at how our eyes travel through a complex painting like this and begin to practice the um, exercise that you'll be doing with um, your own masterwork. This is a beautiful painting by Van Eck, a Flemish painter from the um, early Northern Renaissance. And this is a painting that would have been commissioned by Chancellor Roland, that would be the fellow with the haircut here. He would have commissioned the painting as probably an act of uh, faith or piety, um, a way of uh, showing some status as well, I assume. And the painting shows him worshiping before the Madonna, the mother of God here with the infant Jesus in her lap. She's being crowned by an angel, and of course we see a landscape in the background here. Without a doubt, the most important high-ranking figure in this picture is the little baby who is Jesus, the Son of God. After him, of course, it would be Mary, his mother, also a divine figure. And I don't know who, who outranks who, the angel or Chancellor Rollin, but Chancellor Rollin paid for the painting, and so in uh, Van Eck's mind, he probably had a pretty high rank too. When I ask my students where their eyes go first in this painting, I get many, many different answers. But very few people tell me that they go to the baby first. <laughs> Some people tell me that they start with Chancellor Rollins' head. Some people tell me that they start with these three arches because of the high value contrast. Some people say that they start down here with the mosaics where all the detail in the painting is leading them from front to back. I can tell you how my eyes go through the painting. I start with Mary's face. I slide down this diagonal to look at the figure of Jesus. And then I get lost in the landscape. Of course, I'm a landscape painter, so that would make sense. I like this shiny water out here. These little figures that are standing here looking out over the wall. I then look at the high contrast between the pillars and the sky, and that brings me over to Chancellor Rollin. I look at the high contrast between his face and his hair. I explore the uh, wonderful detail in his clothing here. That brings me down to the detail in the mosaic floor. I work my way back up through this beautiful red robe. Maybe I explore the angel and the crown here and end up back at the face of Mary. Many, many different ways that your eyes can explore the painting. I think this is an example of a painting that is so rich and fully conceived everywhere that the, um, the eye has a lot of liberty to move in many different directions. Let's look at another Van Eck. In this painting, when I ask my students where they think they're supposed to be looking, almost everyone says, at this lamb. And that's without even knowing that the painting is called The Adoration of the Lamb. In this painting, Van Eck is not leaving us a whole lot of options about where to look. He's making it very, very clear. First of all, the painting is symmetrical. And the lamb is right on the center line. This fountain is pointing right at the lamb. There's a sort of tent of golden rays coming down from the sun over the lamb. There are many, many groups of people all focused on the lamb, all surrounding the lamb, all looking towards the lamb, all pointing towards the lamb, all but this guy who is checking out his cell phone, I think. But other than that, everybody is looking at the lamb. And there just really is not that much room for confusion. That's what the picture is about. So in some paintings, artists use um, techniques that make it very, very clear where we're supposed to be looking. And I bet you do know this painting, one of the world's most famous paintings of The Last Supper by da Vinci. In this painting, most people feel, most people that I've, that I've asked, and I've asked a lot, <laughs> most people feel that this figure in the center, who happens to be Jesus Christ, 
is the main point of the painting. And it's pretty clear that Leonardo wants us to think that. There's so many cues. The, um, his figure, first of all, makes a very stable triangle in the middle. It is contrasted against a very, very bright background. And although this head is also contrasted against a bright window, not nearly as fully surrounded as Jesus' head is. Jesus' figure is solitary, whereas all the other figures are grouped. Jesus' figure is facing us, whereas all the other figures are either facing him or pointing to him. Besides being in the middle of the picture, Jesus' head is right in front of the vanishing point for all these parallel lines in the linear perspective system of one-point perspective that da Vinci is using. All these cues let us know without any question where our eyes are supposed to go. And they may travel away from this one focal point out towards other areas of the painting, but they're always brought back to the Christ in the center. Sometimes, of course, lines are not continuous, but can be made of many tiny shapes or even many fairly large shapes. So we may follow lines like a pathway of stepping stones across a creek, or we may follow lines that are really uh, a broken line, a dotted line, a line composed of many small brush strokes. Van Gogh's painting is full of energy. The implied lines in here chart the force and movement of the wind. Even though the dashed lines are really a variety of brush strokes going in the same direction, it implies a line moving through the piece, breaking up spaces in some areas and implying movement in others. Let's look at how your, line, at how your eye might go through this painting. Many people, when I ask them where their eyes start, tell me they start with the moon up here. Sometimes they say that their eyes follow these yellow lights across the sky and then come back with these swirling lines. Usually people finally make their way to this cypress tree and that leads them down into the darkened city below the night sky. That's not the only way to go through the painting though. I've had many people tell me that they start with the cypress tree and that the cypress tree leads them up into the sky. Many people start with this very bright white star here. Some people tell me that they start with the church, with its steeple. However you start, I think you can probably imagine at this point that your eye can follow a very personal path through a painting and that you can describe that path simply by drawing arrows on the painting and showing us how your eye might move. Let's look now at how we're going to be doing that. For assignment 2.1, we are going to draw the movement path of a master artwork using arrows. Then we're gonna take that movement path and sketch it lightly into each of 10 boxes. In those boxes, we're going to create 10 different rough sketches, little designs that attempt to move the eye along that movement path in a different way in each sketch. As you work your sketches up for assignment two, please remember that we are emphasizing line in this assignment. If you use shape, you must either make a line of shapes or make your shape, imply your shape using lines. No outlines of shapes, please. Use at least three different weights, values, and types of line. And let's see how this will look. Here's an example of a student's artwork. The student shows a piece by Jean-Louis Forain and started, um, it looks to me like right here with the uh, bright area where the dancer's putting up her foot to, to tie her shoe. His eye traveled up the dancer's arm, down along her leg, up along the line created by the uh, dress and the beverage on a tray here to this warm red face way in the upper corner, back down to this bundle of light fabric, and then across here to the um, lampshades and up these bright shapes in the corner, back down to 
this blue rectangle. So this is the pattern of motion. I'm going to run my mouse over it again so that you see. Up, down, way up, down, way across, up, down. So there's about, let's see, seven or eight arrows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven arrows to describe this path of motion leading all over this painting. Here are the sketches, a few of the sketches that that student created with that motion path. And what he or she would have done is to draw those arrows in the uh, box and then begin to sort of doodle over them using many different line weights, varieties, and textures to try to move the eye in the same direction. Now you'll notice that the boxes are square. The painting was a wider rectangle. And so the movement pattern is a little bit compressed. It's different, somewhat different, of course, from the movement pattern in the original painting. And that's just fine because we're not trying to copy that painting in any way. What we're trying to do is be inspired with a movement pattern that we're getting from another artist's work. This designer here chose many, many different approaches. So squiggles, dashes, spirals, dots, crosshatching, zigzags, stripes, tangles, many, many ways of creating line in order to move the eye in that same direction. These compositions, if you take this one, say, and this one, might almost look like they were completely unrelated if you didn't know that the same organizing principle, the same movement, was um, being expressed in each one. I'm only showing you six here, just one page of this artist's work, but I want you to make at least ten. I'm going to show you a few examples of different approaches that people have taken. I don't have the movement pattern for these, and of course it disappears if you make it very, very lightly, as I hope you will. It disappears under your drawing. Um, that you can see that this artist did not use quite as much variety, and so although there's a beautifully unified page, the um, the artist would have would have needed to increase the variety of line as he or she worked these up into uh, the final piece. Whether you're very, very experienced at drawing or whether you're fairly innocent and have never drawn much before at all, you don't really need to try to impress anyone with your drawing skills in this at this stage of the assignment. Um, very, very simple uh, approaches can work very, very well here. What I really want you to do is emphasize line and try to get that feeling of movement. One thing that will be very helpful in getting a strong composition is if you work all over your format, touching the edges and bouncing off so that you um, touch as many edges as you can, possibly not all four, but ideally all four edges in each composition. You may work with uh, your Sharpie pen as well as pencil or with some kind of a dark pen or charcoal if you prefer. Um, pencil or charcoal are probably the best for this because you'll get a little bit of uh, value range. Whereas if you work with a pen, you'll get some value range with cross-hatching or by creating tones with repeated shapes, but it will be a little bit harder to really get anything that looks gray. Here are some more examples. Um, this, uh, these pieces were all created from the same motion pattern by one artist. Uh, I only have four of this artist's work. But um, your next step after you create your rough pencil sketches will be to to choose the one that is working the best, to enhance it, to make it better, and to um, uh, work it up as a um, Sharpie drawing at the um, same size as your final illustrator piece, which will be seven inches square. And you can see with the little star here that this artist chose this drawing of, um, from among all the sketches and worked that up into a Sharpie sketch at seven by seven. So that will be the next stage. I have a few more of the Sharpie sketches that I can show you that various student artists have created.
as you work on your thumbnails, I really, really encourage you to keep them um, energetic, lively, simple, not highly, highly finished. When you get to the Sharpie sketch, that will be the time to get things a little bit more highly finished. But at the beginning, it's really, really important to loosen up, be free, have fun. Think of this as doodling, maybe, when you first get started. Um, try to use lots of varying line weight. Try to use overlapping. Think about um, if you do use shape, as this artist has used these little uh, ellipses, remember to use them and uh, repeat them in, in lines so that they carry the eye along. And then they will work very, very well. But we do want to stay away from shapes that are simply outlined as much as possible. Good luck on your sketches, and we'll see you back for the next lecture.